In the spirit of what we were going to do here tonight, I wanted to uh, share with you an ad, and uh, you're seeing it up here on the screen. Has anyone seen this ad? Maybe not if you're a man. It's a real ad, and it was run in a Swedish women's magazine. It's uh, by a company called IKEA, and what makes this ad unique is that well, let me just read it. It says, peeing on this ad may change your life. Okay, now in case you can't see it close up, at the bottom of the ad, you're supposed to tear it out of the magazine. At least I would. I don't think I'd try and maneuver that whole thing. Uh, but you, you take it out and you pee on it. And if you are pregnant, and I'm not joking, uh, if it, it, a, an ad, what will pop up is an ad for a discount on a crib. All right, now, here's what I want to ask you. How many of you think if the advertising agency you hired brought this idea to you, how many of you would think it's a brilliant idea and you would run it all day long? Just add it, let me see. Okay. And be honest, how many of you are like, hell no. Some of you out there too. Okay, so let me, um, you know, and by the way, it's not a coupon, thank God for small favors. You're not, like, supposed to bring it in or anything like that. But, um, yeah. So, um, so, so here's, here's the thing you, I want you to know. They ran one ad. It was very controversial, as you might guess. There were 1,700 articles written about it. Not bloggers, I'm talking about articles in companies like Fast Company, The Guardian, The Washington Post, The Huffington Post. Every major news outlet picked it up and ran it. They, they, um, they estimate they got about $12 million in free advertising from talking about this ad, good and bad. Um, they, they got 4.3 billion views of the ad for free. Oh, and they sold out every crib that they had made. So now, do you think this is a good idea? In hindsight, but even then, some of you are a little squeamish, right? So it got me thinking, maybe I should create an ad like this for all of you for IT services. And what I'm thinking is, maybe you go, if you pee on a competitor's ad, you get a month of managed services for free, maybe. I'm, I'm, work, I'm trying to, I'm working out the, you know, logistics. So I haven't quite got it there yet. But, so anyway, so this, what you're looking at is a very Barnum-esque type ad. So when we decided to do the circus theme for tonight's session, um, it wasn't because of the Greatest Showman movie. It happened to come out at the same time. That was fantastic. But we've been wanting to do the circus for a long time as a theme because I think running a business is like a three-ring circus. I mean, you got a clown car that shows up every day and they all pile out and they, they screw up your day. Then you got screaming monkeys jumping up and down on your desk, flinging poo, wanting a banana, right, every single day. Uh, you've got lions licking their chops, looking at you like you're their next meal. Um, I mean, just it, it's, it's chaos. And so we wanted to do the circus. And since we did the circus theme, I, it would be a gross oversight if I did not do something on Barnum. Barnum, in the advertising world, uh, the marketing, you know, if, they're, if you're a serious student of marketing, then you study Barnum. Barnum is called the Shakespeare of advertising for a reason. So I felt it would be a gross oversight if I didn't do at least one session on Barnum. However, I've got a couple problems with this session uh, when I was putting it together. Um, for starters, it, by today's standards, Barnum is a very controversial figure. So I want you to know if you're sitting there and you're like, oh, he was a horrible human being for all the things he did or whatever conceptions you have. First of all, I would, I would, I would suggest that you study him and not just go by the hyperbole and the, what you think he was. If you really read his books, which I have uh, I've done, I've read all of his books, and you study him, you find out there's a lot more to the man than you might think of just he's known for hoaxes, he, you know, the circus. And so I want you to know, I'm not going to suggest that you do anything like run a hoax or lie or deceive anybody. That's not what we're going to talk about tonight. But I understand he is controversial. So please, let's just set that aside. 
We're not going to be you know, discussing that. The second problem I have is this session is not going to be about a bunch of tools and templates and checklists and here's the sales letter, here's the email you send out, here's how you do a LinkedIn ad. It's not going to be about that. It's going to be about concepts and ideas and how you approach marketing. And I want you to know that you'll get plenty of tools and templates and ideas throughout all the sessions that we're going to give you. So I don't want you to sit there and think, well, that was a big giant waste of time because I didn't get like a checklist, okay? Because you will get those in the conference. And the third problem I have is Barnum was, well, he never did anything small. He was big, he was bold, he got people's attention, like the ad I just showed you. He took risks. And when you do marketing and advertising, sometimes you have to put yourself out there. Well, not sometimes, you have to put yourself out there and sometimes you have to, you have to risk a little bit. And I can tell you, all of you in this audience, including myself, could use a little more Barnum in your advertising because most of you are very timid, you want to be very mild and meek, you know, you, you don't like the, the headline, oh, if it says you're stupid or irresponsible, well, I might offend somebody. Hell yeah, you're going to offend somebody. That's exactly the point because everything else is going to blend in and get ignored and passed over. So in order to get people's attention, to get the message across, it has to hit an emotional nerve. It has to be big. It has to be bold. We have more, now more than ever, we have so much to pay attention to. We are distracted to the umpteenth degree. If your marketing doesn't really stand out, it doesn't get noticed. Now, of course, you can screw that up. You know, you can go too far. But I think most of you err on the side of being way too timid, way too plain vanilla, way too easy, way too let's play small. And I think I'd like to invite you today with this session to think bigger and to think differently and to uncross your arms and not sit there and think, well, that was a giant waste of time. I would never do that. That will never work for me. I could never do that. Oh, I, I could never say those things. I could never do those things. Because my question to you is, where's the profit in that? Where's the profit? I can pull off, I can, I can pull any idiot off the street and say, give me a reason why this won't work. Anybody can come up with a reason. A pessimist will come to me and say, Robin, I'll tell you right now, there's five reasons why that ad won't work. Well, I say, right now, you're not that smart, fella. You're working way too hard. All you need is one good reason it won't work. You know, you got four of them. You're wasting your time. So we know that all of this is big, it's bold, it's going to stretch you from your comfort zone. It's going to make you think bigger and bolder and different. But please, uncross your arms and keep your mind open because like a parachute, the mind is most valuable when it's open, okay? So with that as sort of the, the premise, let me begin. And what I want to start by doing is just give you a little bit of background on this man known as the circus king, uh, Phineas Taylor Barnum. So a lot of people think Barnum and they think circus. And the reality is he was an entrepreneur. He was, by the time he started the circus, he was 61 years old. He was already established and wealthy. So uh, it was a senior project for him. He had already owned a general store, a lottery. He was a museum owner. A, he was in the book auction trade business. He was a real estate investor. He was the, a public speaker, president of a bank, president of Bridgeport Hospital traveling show, of course, author of multiple books. He was the mayor of Bridgeport, a member of the Connecticut House of Representatives, um, and on and on and on. Now, he, um, so Barnum didn't invent the, if you want to use the term freak show, I know that's, again, a very controversial term, but he didn't invent that. He didn't invent the circus, but what he did was he really, truly took it to the next level and reimagined it. And uh, one of the sessions that you're going to see uh, is my good friend, Dr. Nito Cobain at High Point University. And a lot of what Nito Cobain did at High Point is exactly what Barnum did for his museum and what he did for the circus. So he invented a lot of marketing that you see today. So he, was, he actually created the first aquarium. He brought opera to the United States. A lot of people didn't know that. He was the first person to do a successful American tour with Jenny Lind. Um, first to introduce merchandising, first to sell seats by auction, first to promote uh, different seating prices in theaters. He was the first to change the public's opinion about theaters and, and family entertainment. He was one of the first to put that on. He was the first to put a spotlight on the top of a museum. No one had ever seen that before. He was the first to have horse-drawn carriages with billboards on the side. We see that on buses today. I mean, a lot of things that he did 
um, he did invent. But one of the myths about him is that he said a sucker is born, there's a sucker born every minute. And he never, ever said that. Where that actually came from was one of his competitors was standing outside of his, mu his museum, frustrated because Barnum had a long line of people waiting to get into his museum, and a competitor was standing outside, and a news reporter overheard the man saying, oh boy, there's a sucker born every minute, and somehow it got associated with Barnum, but he never said that. The truth is, he wrote a book called Dollars and Cents. He actually wrote quite a few books. And in that, he said, the surest way of deriving the greatest profit in the long run is to give people as much as possible for their money, and he did. So yes, he used hoaxes to get people into his museum, but once they got there, they saw something that was truly spectacular. He had 400,000 people coming to his museum in the 1800s, where folks, let me tell you something, it wasn't like public transportation was easy. You couldn't just hop in a car. I mean, it was a real effort to get to a city. And so for him to accomplish that, a lot of that was word of mouth. People were just so astounded by what they saw. He drove them in. He, he, wrote, in this, uh, he wrote a book called Humbugs of the World because he actually, even though he's known for hoaxes, he was very much against cheating people. And he wrote a whole book of how people were hoaxing others for their money. And he says in there, an honest man who arrests the public's attention will be called a humbug. Um, and uh, it goes on to say, he fails not because he advertises his wares in an outre manner, which is an outrageous manner, but because after attracting crowds of patrons, he stupid and wickedly cheats them. So he was very much about putting on a tremendous show and giving people value for money. That was his heart, that was his soul. So I want you to understand that as I go through this, session, there are six sort of golden rules that I've put together that I saw throughout all of Barnum when I was studying him and reading his books. There were more, but we're kind of limited on our time, so I picked the six that I thought were most important to his success and how he was able to become one of the wealthiest men in America from nothing, started from nothing, and is still a legend to this day to where we're still creating movies about him and having weird people from Nashville dress up like him, right? So let's get on. Let me tell you about the six golden rules. The first golden rule, of course, with Barnum is you've got to advertise in a big way. One of his quotes is, advertising is like learning. A little is a dangerous thing. So when I'm looking at all of his ads, one of the things I noticed is Barnum had a formula. And that's if you want to write something down. I can tell you this, I've studied a lot of successful people, uh, um, from Barnum to you know, Kevin O'Leary, who I have a relationship, or any of the, the people, that, the sharks on Shark Tank, a lot of other very successful people. And I will tell you that all successful people have formulas, and they run to formula. They don't wake up in the morning and invent. They have formulas, they stick to their formulas, and that's how they succeed. So there were seven elements present in every single one of Barnum's ad. One is, of course, an attention-getting headline. If you're a client of mine for more than five minutes, you know the most important part of the ad is the headline. If it's on your website, it's the top third of the page. It's the subject line in an email. On a sales letter, it's the top of the letter. What does it say? Um, when you are uh, delivering a telemarketing voicemail, or you are talking to a prospect, it's what you say, that's your, your headline. And every one of Barnum's ads had an attention-getting headline. There was always very bold graphics and imagery. Caught your eye, just looking at it, it's instantly caught your eye. Always curiosity. And we're gonna talk about how you can use that in, uh, in selling IT services. Dynamic copy, very sensational story. There was always a story behind something. He never just had a display. There was always a story of where it came from and its travels and how he came upon it. Um, always entertaining to read, of course, promise of entertainment and scarcity. Uh, when he had displays, it was always out for a little bit and then he took it away. He was never, all, and there was nothing ever always available. He used scarcity uh, in, a, in a very unique way. So if you look at even Barnum's museum, he took over this museum, it was the Scudder Museum, and uh, when, when he took it over, it was really just sort of a dusty, run-down establishment. It had some taxidermy displays, it was basically bankrupt. He renamed it Barnum's American Museum. He put flags, all different flags of the nations across the top, he put a spotlight on the top of it. Um, every night he had a fireworks display, he had an aquarium inside, he had a garden on the outside, uh, up on the rooftop. 
Um, he had balloon rides. You could get hot air balloon rides at the top of it. So he really turned this into something magnificent. On the outside, there were over 100 ovals of hand paintings of different a a animals and attractions he had inside. So just walking by it, you wanted to go in. And again, all of his ads, all of his marketing, Bold headlines, bold image, bold graphics, promises like 3,250 costly costumes, 250 singers in weird oriental choruses, 300 dancing girls, 1,200 actors and actresses, the wizardry wonders, the magic of the Orient. I mean, it was, everything was always exciting. So here's a big lesson for all of you. And it was taught to me by one of my mentors. I first heard it from one of my mentors, Dan Kennedy. And that is the number one sin in marketing is being boring. The number one sin in marketing is being boring. So people send me their letters that are boring on boring letterhead. And they're boring openers. And they're mealy, we kind of like to meet with you. You can't be boring. People just pass you over. So how many of you recognize this guy? Anyone remember this? Todd Davis, CEO of LifeLock? Nobody? I'm the only one? Right? How did he advertise? Anyone remember the ads? Right. So here's, here's what's interesting. He sold, he sold uh, LifeLock uh, to Symantec for $2.3 billion. Now, he had a little run-in with the FTC. Yes, he did. He had a $100, $100 million fine. But let me ask you, that's, is that a speed bump on the way to $2.3 billion? I think so. He had his identity stolen 13 times. Well, so let me show you an example of one of his ads. I'm Todd Davis, and I'm here to prove just how safe your identity can be with LifeLock. That's my real social security number. Leading the way in identity theft prevention, LifeLock helps keep your personal information safe, even in the wrong hands. Someone steals my identity. He goes into an RV dealership to buy this $82,000 RV using my name, my credit. Well, he didn't know that I had signed up for LifeLock. I get a telephone call. He gets arrested. End of story. Guarantee your good name today. You'll also see a huge reduction in junk mail and pre-approved credit offers. No junk mail, sign me up. We aim to stop identity theft before it happens. LifeLock aims to make sure it's really you whenever credit is issued in your name. And we can prove it with a free 30-day test drive. Simply call 1-800-607-9154 and mention Test Drive. That's 1-800-607-9154 or go to lifelock.com. Okay, so that is a very Barnum-esque type ad. It's bold. It's, you remember it. I mean, even though, and, 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 and that people feel that that's like very outrageous. We couldn't do that. But that's exactly what he did, and it made this company hugely successful. So then you might be saying, well, how can I use this in my marketing and advertising? So I've got an idea for you, and I want to give credit to Rob Ray. How many of you know Rob Ray? That, yeah, right? Okay, so Rob Ray. He couldn't be here tonight. I wanted him to tell the story, so I had, to, I had him like email me and tell me a little bit of the details. So this is a photo of the first demo that they ever did in Australia. So let me read this for you, okay? We had zero staff and zero MSPs using our product, and this was the first ever road show we did in Australia and New Zealand. We used this demo using flash paper where they would set a server on fire and then restore it, right? He said, so we did this demo using flash paper hundreds of times in the U.S., never overseas. The two problems we had, first, you can't travel with flash paper on planes, so we had to buy some when we got to Australia. Second, flash paper is stored slightly damp. So you need to dry it out ahead of time to avoid it smoking. Well, he didn't have time to do that. So... Uh, the other thing is in Europe and Australia, apparently they're a little more overzealous than we are about fire protection. And so he did this demo in a hotel and the smoke set off the fire alarms. Two fire trucks, eight firefighters showed up. The entire Marriott hotel we did the demo in had to be evacuated. <laughs> it cost him $8,000 in fines. 
However, they did sign up the first two partners at that event, which did more than $40,000 in MRR for this per year. So again, very good example of LifeLock, very Barnum-esque, bold, audacious, a little bit risky. That's what made it interesting. That's what made it memorable. Now, here's another one that I, I got to thank Rob for, the folks at Datto. Um, and that is, this is a picture of an event they did with a partner in Cedar Rapids. And what, that, what you're looking at is um, they, they wanted to get, well, what they wanted to do is they got their, their customers out to an event. So they rented a, a clubhouse and a gun range. And what they did is they sort of virtualized a server and then they, had, they brought out printers and old equipment and they let people basically shoot at it, right? And then they restored it. And uh, again, so this was what you're seeing here for this disaster demo we, demo. we had a guy shoot the device we were running our presentation on. It was all very safe. It blue screened the device and then we virtualized and kept it going. So again, this is an example of a very Barnum-esque type demonstration that I promise you, if you take your clients out to a gun range and then let them shoot their server and then bring it back up, that's an event. Well, hopefully you have a backup. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> test, you know. That would be a little bit interesting. Sorry, we just blew up your server. Um, I guess make them sign something before you do it or whatever. But So that's an, another example of a very Barnum-esque type ad. Now, this is one that some of you may have seen recently. So this is, again, very Barnum-esque, big, bold advertising. It was an Infusionsoft campaign that we did. Um, we mailed out, what you're looking at here is a box of chocolates and little candy nuts. And it says, you'd be nuts not to check this out. And there was a card with it, and it said, um, uh, from your secret ad admirer, I'd love to show you something sweet. And then inside it said, you've been shot by Cupid and handpicked by a secret admirer for spe a special Valentine offer. And it said, go to this uh, website, um, because just like chocolate and some puppy love romances, it won't last forever, har har. So go to this website and check out this video. So that's involvement, by the way. You know, I just want you to see that. Getting someone to open it, so first of all, that's the first challenge you have whenever you send any campaign. It can be direct mail, it can be an email, it doesn't matter. Your first challenge is getting them to open it and to read it. The next thing is getting them to get involved and take the first step. So the first step was to go online and watch the video, and it was actually a video of Allison, and it talked about a new done-for-you and run-for-you services that we did, encouraging them to book an appointment to learn more. We had a 17% response rate. Now, I'm, when I say response rate, I mean appointments booked and held. I don't, now, we had a higher response if you count people we talked to and said they might be interested, et cetera. I'm talking about 17% of the people we sent this to booked an appointment. That's, as our president would say, huge, right? Huge. 17% response rate and 50% close rate on that campaign. Um, I want to show you another campaign I couldn't resist. Wayne Springer uh, posted up on the queue that he had run the pizza campaign and he had gotten three appointments, I think. I'm going off of memory. And uh, is he here? There you go. All right, there you are. I think that's what you said. Anyway, so I said, you know, send me the details. Now, the pizza campaign is a campaign I actually wrote a couple years ago um, when I had, and I can't even remember the original member who came to me and needed help because he wanted to target CPAs, but it was tax season. And, you know, the, the hardcore belief is that you can't market to CPAs during tax season because they're so busy, et cetera, et cetera. So I came up with this idea of delivering a pizza to their office during tax season, not really to sell anything, but just to say, hey, we're here in case you need us. So you're looking at the actual campaign. I've posted, by the way, these letters. So you can go up online in these campaigns. You can go up on the dashboard. You can download these and look at these closer later on. Um, but it just says, uh, you know, my name is Wayne Sp Springer. I'm founder of uh, Ottawa Computing, Inc. We specialize in working with accounting firms like yours. And because of working with accounting firms, I know uh, this is the biggest time of year for you. And likely, you're working ridiculous hours, sleeping on your sofa in the office, and um, it just makes an offer of saying, we're staffed up here. If you need after-hour support, if something goes down and you can't get a hold of your IT guy, please feel free to call us. That's the whole letter. So what they did, they targeted about 20 CPAs, 13 they said were potential prospects. I think some of them, after they actually went out and visited them, they kind of eliminated, said, ah, they're probably not a right fit. Um, they built four delivery routes, so they had the pizzas, they got them hot, and they just went out and delivered. They didn't call in advance. Uh, the letter was, um, and the business card was taped to the top of the box 
with no envelope on it. They didn't call ahead. They just went in, asked for who the owner or the manager was, and said, we've got some free pizza here for you. Asked for the card of the business owner, made notes on it, and followed up accordingly. Okay, so this is another example of a very Barnum-esque type ad. You know, you can mail a postcard all day long. Nobody's going to remember it. But you, mail, you, you walk in with a hot pizza, they're going to at least get their attention. You're at least got now a chance. And I'm going to tell you, you know, I do a lot of marketing. Obviously, as you know, I've been in marketing of my whole life. I, know, I never want to do anything less than this kind of marketing anymore because I'm telling you, people's attention spans, it's just so hard to break through. You've got to really have something big and bold to do it. I'll remind you, how many of you have used the Sneaky Duck campaign, right? This is another very Barnum-esque type ad. So for those of you in the back, you might not be aware, the, the whole concept is you send out this little rubber duck, duck in a box, and the card just says, is your business a sitting duck for cyber criminals? Find out and go to this website. And it basically is an online shock and all saying, you know, you're at risk for cyber crime, cyber liability. And uh, this campaign really works because people remember it. And of course, if you follow up, we're the people who sent you the duck. They remember you, you know, try and call somebody after you've sent them a postcard. Yeah, maybe they remember you, maybe they don't. But they will remember a duck.